Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, and it's a pleasure on behalf of the, uh, the British Journal of Surgery and the European Hernia Society to welcome you to the BGS EHS Prize uh, webinar. And um, how do you get into this competition? Well, it's relatively straightforward and the 2022 competition uh, is about to open, but essentially you have to be a member of the European Hernia Society and you've satisfied that already because you're on the webinar. You have to submit a paper to the British Journal of Surgery on a topic related to hernia and hernia science between the 1st of February and the 31st of May this year. You need to submit an abstract to um, Manchester EHS 2022, which um, the abstract closure date for that is the 1st of June. So that ties in with the 31st of May and you need to notify the EHS Secretariat. But we will go over um, and publicize the entry criteria again, but the key thing is for you to be writing your papers on a hernia related topic and get ready to submit it to the BGS before um, the 31st of May. Uh, I neglected to introduce my uh, co-chairman. Uh, I'm Andrew Debo, and I'm uh, General Secretary of the European Hernia Society. My co-chair is Manuel Lopez Cano from uh, Barcelona, who is the general is the Secretary of Publications and editor of JAWS, the new uh, journal of the European Hernia Society. A few um, 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 housekeeping rules before we launch into it. First of all, please uh, ask any questions through the Q and A. You can certainly use the chat, but we can't see the chat, so um, ask your questions uh, through uh, the Q&A. All the speakers have an active presence on Twitter, so if we don't get through all your questions, feel free to introduce uh, and chat to them on Twitter. And if you could use the hashtag for tonight, it's hashtag BJS EHS um, uh, Prize Webinar 22. So hashtag BJS EHS Prize Webinar uh, 22. Uh, Two. So I think, and the final thing is the session is being recorded and will be available through the EHS uh, and BGS channels uh, in the near future. So without any further ado, I hand over to my co-chair Manuel to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, first of all, uh, well, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. Um, of course, thank you very much for to the European Hernia Society and BGS uh, Society for the kind invitation to be part of and co-chair together with Andrew this, uh, this webinar about BGS uh, prices. And it is my pleasure uh, to introduce you and welcome our first uh, speaker. Uh, the name of our first speaker is Ben Novik. He is working in, in Solna in Sweden and uh, in the Department of uh, Clinical Science of uh, Dandai uh, Hospital and he will present us uh, this interesting uh, paper entitled Mess and Fixation Options with, re with Reoperation Risk After Laparoscopic Grain Hernia Surgery. So, uh, Ben, when you want, uh, the, the screen is yours. Thank you. So, Thank you, Manuel. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to take the opportunity here. I think there are some Swedish surgeons uh, viewing this and on behalf of all the authors and the uh, steering group of the registry, I'd like to thank you all for uh, contributing patients. patients. Otherwise, a study like this would not have been possible. Um, um, this is uh, our Bible. And uh, regarding tap and tap in the mesh chapter, um, uh, comparing standard, also known as heavyweight mesh with lightweight mesh, it says that there is no long-term differences. And um, in the next chapter regarding mesh fixation, uh, they recommend non-fixation for just about all hernia types, except maybe for large medial defect. However, that is with quite uh, low evidence level, so that might be considered more of a suggestion. Um, it's common to do this. So you look either on mesh or fixation, but not of them together. And but we believe maybe they should be considered to be a system, one entity. And so the objective of this study was to look at combinations of mesh fixation with regard to reoperation risk. 
A very important comment is in the MESH chapter. And that is when you want to um, investigate these things, it requires quite a lot of patience. And if you want to, as in our case, investigate both of them in combination really requires a multiple of a lot of patients. Um, I tried to um, depict it like this. If uh, each rectangle here should sort of symbolize one mesh fixation um, combination and the percentages here um, show you that in the short term, at least, there's quite a, a rare event to have a reoperations. And that's the reason why you need so many repairs. Um, but we have a lot of uh, repairs in our registry. Uh, you can see here, this is maybe the first time you will see the brand new logo of the hernia registry. It started in 1992, the registry, and became nationwide some years later in 1998. Um, what I show here is the proportion of minimally invasive repairs among all growing hernia repairs in our country. Uh, 20 years ago, there were not so many, in 2001, we introduced the variable fixation method. And in 2005, we introduced the mesh material as variable, which means that if you want to look at both of these together, you can go back no further than 2005. So we said we needed a lot of patients. So in 2011, I decided to try to make uh, uh, an attempt to look at this and I, uh, um, submitted an abstract to, to that to the, to the World Congress in New York 2012 before the analysis was finalized. And it turned out we were underpowered, so we couldn't really um, uh, draw any firm conclusions. Uh, what we could see, however, was and that was maybe for the first time that lightweight mesh is indeed an independent risk factor for recurrence. Uh, we were, so we needed more annual cohorts, and we were lucky that laparoscopic surgery became more and more popular. So in, in, in 2018, about a third of, of the repairs were laparoscopic, and then we wanted to have at least one year of follow-up, so we included patients from 2005 to 2017. Uh, the variables were the reoperation and the exposures, mesh and fixation, but we also needed some risk factors. Uh, to adjust for in, in the multivariable analysis. Uh, the last one here is surgical unit, which is sort of a surrogate for individual surgeon, which we were not able to assess on a national level. The strategy was to first, in a preliminary analysis, look at mesh and fixation separately in order to, because we wanted to have a limited number of, of combinations for the final stage analysis of mesh and fixation in combination. Uh, here's the flow chart. We had more than 200,000 repairs. Most of those were open. Um, of the laparoscopic repairs, um, some did not fulfill the inclusion criteria. So for the first stage preliminary analysis of uh, separate of mesh and fixation, we had 25,000 repairs. And after that analysis, we ended up with almost 19,000 repairs for the final stage analysis. Um, in the mesh uh, group, we had a standard pure polypropylene mesh. We had lightweight mesh and we had polyester because polyester is quite rare in, in my country. Um, the Swedish classification does not differentiate between the weights. And in the lightweight mesh group, we had lightweight pure polypropylene mesh. Then we have these three brand names with their different variants, which we do not differentiate between. In the fixation group, there was a quite even distribution between no fixation, tax, and fiber and glue. Uh, the tax were unclassified uh, until 2011, and after that, we had uh, different types of tax, and the most common ones were metal and absorbable tax. Uh, so in the first stage analysis of meshes, uh, we found that light, most lightweight meshes behaved very similarly, except for Vipro, which was an outlier. And also because polyester, we didn't know the weight, so we excluded both those. In the fixation group, we were a little unhappy and surprised to find that uh, um, uh, the tags behaved differently, so we could not merge them into one unclassified group. 
Uh, so th we ended up with four fixation alternatives. If you look at the standard pure polypropylene mesh, that means without fixation, with metal tags, absorbable tags, and fiber and glue. Then we had the same for the lightweight meshes. So all in all, eight combinations. So from all these repairs, we ended up on the right there, 630 re-operations out of 19,000 repairs. Um, this is the actual uh, re cumulative reoperation rate. This is a standard pure polypropylene mesh without fixation. And this is a uh, lightweight mesh without uh, fixation. You will find that the dotted lines represent lightweight meshes. And then we have the fiber and glue, and we have the metal tags, and we have the uh, absorbable tags. So from this, we wanted to do uh, to know the proportional differences adjusted for risk factors. And um, we chose standard pure polypropylene mesh without fixation being the reference. And in a, a Cox analysis, the reference is always hazard ratio one. And uh, so this is pure uh, standard pure polypropylene mesh without fixation. Compared to that, lightweight mesh had a double risk without fixation. Um, absorbable tags did not really help. Metal tags seem to maybe do a little better, but uh, that's not really significant. Um, fiber and glue with standard mesh did not do any difference. However, lightweight mesh with, it, with um, elevated risk, that risk was uh, eliminated if uh, doctors used uh, fiber and glue. And if you look at this, uh, the four curves at the bottom here, if you look at the hazard ratios and the confidence intervals, they should be interpreted as having the same outcome. So when looking at the recurrence risk, we suggest um, using, if, if you want to use standard pure polypropylene mesh, you should not need to fixate. Uh, like in many countries in Sweden, it's much more popular to use a lightweight mesh and in those cases, we would recommend uh, fiber and glue fixation. So thank you very much. And lastly, I just want to say that this study will be published in the Journal of American College of Surgeons in the March issue, open access, which means if you're interested in the details, um, you can download it for free. Thank you. Ben, thank you very much. Um fascinating uh, study and one of the, the real benefits of registry data where over the years you gather a large amount of, uh, of data. A question that I have, what do you think the influence of the surgeon is in all of this? Do you think uh, there's a difference between, the, between surgeons um, who use lightweight versus heavyweight and can, do you think surgeon variables may influence some of the outcomes? Of course, and that was... Uh said that in the beginning, that is maybe the, as we know, individual surgeon is probably the most important risk factor for, you know, for all types of adverse events. Uh, um, we, we could not um, uh, adjust for that. We could adjust for, for surgical unit, that is a surgical department or center. And um, we could see that it was quite evenly distributed. Some very good surgeons uh, use fiber and glue, but also beginners use it. So it's, as you can see, it's about a third of the cases in Sweden, people use fiber and glue. Um, you can never in an observational study sort of uh, say that there's, it couldn't ha have uh, uh, affected that. Uh, but we have tried to, to um, adjust for it. And if you look at the, all the big numbers, it seems like all kinds of surgeons do this. Also the same, if you look at, at uh, uh, the other types of combinations, it's very well distributed uh, among Sweden. I have some questions um, coming in. Do you collect any data on whether defects were closed or any attempt to control, say, for M3 um, uh, defects that might have influenced outcome? Yeah, that's a very good one. That has been more popular. In Sweden, We normally we don't close the defect. I know some people in the world do that, and it could have maybe have uh, affected it. Uh, I can't say. One thing that was... Uh, annoyed me a little. I wanted to look at the different defect sizes because defect size is a big uh, risk factor. Um, we, we could see that the pattern was similar for small mesh, for small defects and uh, 
middle-sized defects, but the, the numbers were too small for the large defects. But to, to answer your question, we normally do not uh, close a defect. You can, I can't say if that would have changed. Within the registry, do you have any follow-up pain data and could you identify any differences between those groups? And I guess from your summary, you're suggesting that there's no need for tack fixation if you have access to fibrin glue uh, fixation. Um, uh, well, the first question was uh, about the pain, and um, uh, we, we have our next project in the same in the same uh, study here, or next study in this project is actually we're look going to look at uh, uh, pain data after one year, and, and uh, compare that with the, which type of uh, mesh and fixation was used. So we do not know that already, but we know for sure that uh, penetrating fixation may cause pain. I think that is well known. Um, what was your second question? Um, and then uh, the, the second question kind of related to the fact that actually you don't ag advocate the use of tax at all if you have access to fibrum glue and you want to use a lightweight mesh. Well, um, there, there are some things that we don't have in our register. One, one um, variable is uh, uh, how big the mesh is. We don't register that. In Sweden, we're taught not to use meshes smaller than 10 by 15 centimeters, but we don't know if, if on a large mesh, if people use a very much larger mesh for that or not. We cannot say. I would say that uh, with a fiber glue, you probably need a good overlap, but uh, there's we don't have that data in the registry. Sure. Manuel, any comments yeah. from you? Yeah, I, I have a question to, to Ben. Uh, uh, in light of these uh, results, as, as a result of uh, real-world evidence of, from our registry, uh, do you recommend some change in the practice of the surgeons in your country? And uh, another question is, what, what are you doing now? Uh, how do you fix the mess and which type of mess are you using uh, uh, you in your regular practice? Well, personally, I, I am because I... <laughs> It's a little embarrassing because I pioneered fiber and glue 20 years ago. So it's, uh, I was surprised actually to find it, it's, it works so good. My personal experience is that it works very nice. I, I use uh, um, just any lightweight pure polypropylene mesh, not too large pores because I think it's, if they're, they're too large, they may have a problem sticking. Um, and then I use the fiber and glue if I can. Some uh, I work in different hospitals, and some uh, say it's, it's too expensive where they just don't have it. So it's. Okay. But I don't think there's anything wrong if you put in a another mesh without fixation. Uh, you, if you, the important thing is, all, of course, the dissection. So you really do a good dissection, and and uh, you follow the principles that have been outlined by Edward Felix and others. So. Uh, if you do that right, I think maybe that's the most important. And uh, you don't, well, re you don't recommend permanent tuckers or absorbable tuckers? That's a very good question. I personally, if I should use uh, tax, I use absorbable tax. And that is for the pain, let's say, hypothesis. That is, would be good if they cause pain that they eventually um, fade away. Uh, so that's actually what I do. I don't... Um, I don't like, I think yeah, the ProTac, for example, is a great it work, it's very easy to use. But uh, when I started with this, my interest in this was many years ago when I did the IPOM and I could see that uh, the patients, they complained of pain and I could see that that's where I have done the fixation. So um, so I would I would personally use absorbable tax, yeah. But that's uh, obviously, that's not uh, what I should do if I look at my data. Yeah. Yeah, there's evidence in what I do. Thanks, Ben. That was a, a phenomenal talk. And it's a, a real pleasure for me to uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Barbara East. And it was a pleasure to have her as a, a overseas fellow in my unit uh, last year. And she's going to talk to us about liquid resorbable nanofibrous mesh, a proof of concept. Uh, Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm not sure how much pleasure I was <laughs> for you and your team. I, I uh, slightly doubt it. But thank you very much for the opportunity to present this work here. It's slightly philosophical and a little bit less concrete like Banks. Um, 
lecture was, and I'm going to speak about a proof of concept and an animal model of something that we maybe all secretly dream about, and it's a mesh, it's in a liquid form. And my presentation's not moving. Oh, it is now. Um, I would like to say that I was influenced in my research pathway by some very famous scientists, but unfortunately, it was the outer limits. It's a very old um, sci-fi series that has introduced nanomedicine probably more than 30 years ago. And um, they have all the parts that have something in common. They, they not only speak about something completely out of the box, but they also have some catastrophic ending usually. If we look at the evolution of surgery in the last roughly 7,000 years, we can see that we have gone a long way. And um, tissue engineering and nanoscience in general is there somewhere in the 80s. So it's quite, quite old. Uh, nanoscience in general transcends the boundaries of traditional scientific disciplines. And it works at a scale where chemistry, material science, electricity, and mechanical engineering converge. Just imagine that each one of you would have a nose that would be one nanometer big. Then each one of your red blood cells would be as big as Empire State Building. Each one of your hair would be about three miles wide. Uh, you could fit continental United States on your fingertip and you would be as tall as seven planet Earths. If you look on the internet, there's tons of products on the market already based on nanoscience. And it is predicted that by 2030, uh, the first human brain will be connected to the internet. In medicine, we are in the same place. Many of us have had the COVID jet because of nanoscience. Some of our cancer surgi surgical colleagues may run out of business very soon thanks to drug delivery system. And maybe each one of you have a liquid nano glass as a protective screen on your, on your mobile phone. So when I started my surgical pathway many years ago, I've read these two papers and um, I've looked it up on Google as I usually do. And I found out that the real story is even worse than what these two papers suggested. And then I went to my first EHS conference and I was basically brainwashed that everything I have to do has to include mesh and the mesh has to be strong enough and it has to do this, this and this. And I also had a very demanding boss who, um, had a very well-equipped laboratory and gave me quite a challenging PhD topic, which 12 years ago started as a hunt to produce an extracellular matrix out of nanofibers. We had the gear to make it and we decided to go through the minimal resistance route, use hyaluronic acid and PCL, both polymers approved for human use. And we have somehow succeeded and we've tortured millions of fibroblasts over the years and tested if they stay alive and if they proliferate. And not only uh, they survived on our materials, but they also increased their uh, metabolic activity and they started to proliferate. So we thought we're going the right way. But um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I also have a friend who is also very demanding and he kept teasing me the whole time that we need to make something which we can just spray on. It's not good enough if it disappears after time and, and it does this and this and this and it costs next to nothing. It has to be sprayable. So when the lab bought a cryogenic freezer or freezer miller, some, some sort of fancy blender, we were able to turn these nanofibers into a powder. And as Bengt uh, mentioned, fibrin glue, we also liked fibrin glue. And we have mixed it with um, a slow polymerization um, speed fibrin glue. This is what it looked like. And it was almost a school-like experiment. We were really just trying to see if it works or not. So we mixed our fibers with a fibrin glue. Uh, some of the samples also contained human um, plasma. And this is what, what we ended up with. And this we poured over a closed laparotomy on a, in a rabbit model. We gave it a little bit time to set. And six weeks later, all these poor bunnies have undergone an autopsy. And their abdominal wall was subjected to some mechanical and histopathological evaluation. Histology is something that all the journals are usually more interested in rather than the real results. So 
We've, we have observed that the collagen fibers are more aligned in the groups that did have nanofibers compared to the groups that only had the fibrin glue alone without any, any further enhancement. And as you can see here, um, the orange is collagen type one, uh, while more green is collagen type three. So when we compare the fibrin glue by itself, it was more collagen type three in the newly formed connective tissue and more of collagen type one in the newly formed um, connective tissue in the, in the group with the nanofibers. What is more important for uh, people and for surgeons, I believe, is the mechanical testing. So um, the ultimate testile strength, tensile strength was roughly the same in all the groups, but it's very rarely that each one of us gets stretched until we rupture or explode. It doesn't really happen, but what we do, we move, we breathe, we talk, we skip, we do sit-ups, we jump, we do all these activities where the yield strength is a lot more decisive of how we're gonna end up. And we have observed that when we compared it to suture alone and also to the fibrin glue alone, that some of the samples we have prepared have showed significantly higher and almost double the amount of yield strength compared to, to the other groups. So in other words, we did not prevent this, but we created something which is able to prevent this. And this is my last slide. This was really a school-like experiment on 30 animals just to prove that something like this can work. And we have shown that we can modify how fascia heals, even with something which has no mechanical strength at all. And we have shown a difference between the fibrin glue mixed with nanofibers, which were blended in a powder form, and fibrin glue by itself, and most importantly, just a suture alone. I think that the mesh as we know it should slowly start thinking about moving to the museums because new materials are on the doorstep. And I really do hope that it will be my generation that will have the pleasure to experience those. Thank you very much. And um, if you are thinking slightly more out of the box, I hope you will join the EHS annual conference in 2024 in Prague. Thank you. Manuel, Thank you. over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Barbara, for the, a nice, very nice presentation. And, and of course, uh, as you know, the gap uh, for the majority of surgeons between the experimental, experimental way to clinical uh, way is, is very, very large because the majority of us, uh, we are dedicated to clinical research, not experimental research. And at least from my side, we are learning here from you, from this type of, uh, of experiments, of the ty this type of research. So congratulations for this research. So, uh, however, I have uh, maybe a recurrent question for you uh, when you present this, uh, this research. And my question is, when the liquid mess uh, will be available, available for the surgeons in order to, to use in the clinical practice? And which type of uh, steps uh, uh, you should do uh, for the final application, if possible, at the end of the, of the road? Uh, well, when it will be available for clinical practice, I don't know. I do hope that somebody who has the ability to actually manufacture it will start thinking that way. And I did speak to one manufacturer already, and they are they are very interested in learning more and and working towards this. But I think the the general surgeons are going to be the biggest blocker on this because people don't believe in newer concepts, and you can see that. Uh, we still talk about lightweight and heavyweight mesh and uh, large pore and small pore and the pores are too big. And there's so many things which, which if, if the mesh becomes slightly too flimsy, we don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. But I think and I, I hope I will slowly convince uh, more people around me that it's not about the mesh. It's about the message we give to the cells and what we tell them to do because... We, 
the human body is is a miracle and we can we can heal and we can do lots of things if we just get the right impulse to do so so if the message is right i i believe we can we can start treating hernias a slightly different way and at the at the final step of the of this of this experimental research uh, if if you arrive uh, the best uh, comparison between a, a regular mesh uh, what will be a heavyweight mesh or a lightweight mesh uh, compared with a liquid mesh or well, um, in this in this experiment, we have tested the, it as a prophylactic mesh. There is a, a lot of research going into prophylactic mesh, and there's a lot of publications, and and I think we all have accepted that it works. And for certain individuals with some risk factors, I think this would replace any any mesh. For treatment of hernias, I think there is still just such a long way to to go. It's it's. It, it will need somebody more clever than, than me and, and my team to, to mm -hmm. make the next step. But as a prophylactic mesh, I think if, if somebody takes it on, it could be on the market very quickly because it's all approved for human use. It's relatively simple to make and it costs next to nothing to produce. What do you think the prophylaxis in every patient or only selected patients? I, I wouldn't mind having it in myself. It disappears over time. It's biodegradable. Um, we, we think that it can disappear within 500 hours when you, when you cook it on a stove on a living body. It could be two or three years before it goes completely away. But uh, if it, for example, if it only costs 10 euros, then it would be up to some financial analysts to count how much does it cost to prevent a hernia, to treat a hernia versus how much would it cost to prevent prevented um, at 10 euros per person operated. Okay. I don't know, Andrew, you see if you have any question or... I have a couple of questions. So when you're a, a multi-billionaire because this has gone <laughs> global, will you remember us? And um, I can send you my bank account details now if, if you remember. But obviously this was one, you know, this was glue and it was um, one um, uh, biochemical... Uh, uh, nanofiber, but is that the best one? I presume there's a lot you can you can spin any any chemical uh, nanofiber, and will we need to do quite a lot of work? What the best liquid to have it in suspension? Well, any any a soluble polymer can be electrospun and turned into fibers, and then it can be frozen and melt. So there is uncountable uncount number of options that you have, and that you can produce the the thing is that we tried six out of the six it seemed that one worked so <laughs> i think um if we keep working on that one that worked we can we can maybe get a step ahead but maybe there is 60 others or 600 hours or six six million others that will work better and it's it's up to some laboratory with on much larger scale to to find out and i can say from my own perspective i don't think i can kill any more rabbits I've, <laughs> i just i just can't we have a question from martin simmons do you think that this sort of science and technology say for example you had an inlay or you had a bigger mesh but involved bridging would be applying this to the sort of bridged area do you think that would be enough to get the body to regenerate a fascia of quality and then we are no longer frightened of bridging? I don't know. Uh, one of our earlier experiments was standard polypropylene mesh, which was coated with nanofibers. And that did work better than the polypropylene mesh on its own. So I think there can be, again, some sort of combination of meshes created, which would maybe make bridging slightly less prone for failure than what we see currently. But and this liquid by itself can't bridge anything, no. It's got no mechanics right. This is real cool science fiction. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Um, that was really exciting. And you heard it first here. And back to Manuel to introduce the next speaker. 
Okay, so thank you, Andrew, and it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker is Duncan Scrickmore. Uh, he's a, a colorectal surgeon, is uh, working in the, at the University of Aberdeen. And he uh, will discuss uh, a paper entitled Unmodified Del Delphi Process to Establish Research Priorities in Hernia Surgery. Uh, Duncan, when you want. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, my name is Duncan Scrimger and I'm presenting here today on behalf of the Hernia Delphi Steering Committee, which was formed to help establish research priorities in hernia surgery. I have no disclosures. Abdominal wall hernia repair is one of the most commonly performed surgical procedures worldwide. Yet despite this, there remains a lack of high quality evidence to support best management. Delphi methodology is a well-established process used to collate judgments, opinions, and consensus on a specific topic. This methodology has been successfully utilized to identify research priorities in many surgical specialties. The process can help to identify the direction that future research should take and can help to guide funding bodies and channel resources. Modified Delphi techniques have also been used in the field of hernia surgery. For example, recent consensus has helped to provide definitions for loss of domain and for the classification of abdominal wall planes to describe mesh insertion. But to the best of our knowledge, no previous attempt has been made to determine what future research priorities in hernia surgery should be. We therefore used a modified Delphi process to identify and prioritize future research questions that were deemed to be of greatest importance to patients, surgeons and allied health professionals. This study was undertaken as a collaboration between the Scottish Surgical Research Group and the British Hernia Society. A three-phase modified Delphi technique was used. Questions pertaining to hiatal hernia surgery were excluded. Stakeholders were initially invited to submit questions and then to prioritize their responses based upon their perceived clinical relevance and importance. A steering committee was, was formed to help guide the process. BHS members were invited to by email to submit research-focused hernia surgery questions via an online survey, and a dedicated Twitter account was also used to increase the awareness of the study and to encourage wider stakeholder participation. During phase two, stakeholders were invited via email and Twitter to rank the phase one questions using a Likert scale. The steering committee reviewed the results whilst blinded to the questions and selected a mean cutoff of greater than or equal to 3.6 for inclusion in the final phase of the study. During this final phase, stakeholders were again invited to rank the questions brought forward from phase two and a final mean cutoff score of greater than or equal to four was agreed by the steering committee. Each phase was open for six weeks, five reminder tweets were made and two email reminders were sent to the British Hernia Society members. During the final phase, an invitation to complete the survey was also advertised during the BHS 2020 virtual conference. Now, unique to this study was a 10 patient focus group, which was held at the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in February 2020. This session was facilitated by two of the steering committee patient and public involvement members who helped to guide the group discussion. Recurring themes that were deemed to be important to the majority of the focus group participants were identified and collated during the course of the day. 
Questions were submitted during the three phases by stakeholders from all six continents, with Europe submitting the most questions during each phase. In phase one, 247 questions were submitted by 103 stakeholders from 19 countries. 19 further questions were proposed by the patient focus group and 64 out of 266 questions were then moved forward for prioritization to phase two. 107 stakeholders from 14 countries prioritized the questions in phase two and 36 questions were brought forward for the final prioritization in phase, in phase three. In phase three, there were 97 stakeholders from 16 countries and following this final prioritization, 14 questions met the criteria to be defined as high research priority. Three of these questions were from the patient focus group. Unsurprisingly, many of the final prioritized questions focused on mesh, pain, and what the optimal outcome measures following hernia surgery should be. Additional questions were related to the UK hernia registry, hernia rates, and IPOMs. The, the tension-free vaginal mesh controversy has, has had a, a significant impact on patients' trust in their surgeon. These concerns are, are, are understandable given the, the media frenzy, but the evidence for the use of mesh is compelling. However, to date, there are over 300 meshes available, each with unique characteristics. It's therefore not surprising that mesh-related research questions made the final prioritised list. In 2018, the European Hernia Society published comprehensive international guidelines for groin hernia management. Many of these recommendations are related to meticulous surgical technique. A multidisciplinary approach to the management of, groin, of chronic pain has been recommended, but there is a positive evidence available on which treatment strategies are most, are most effective. The primary outcome measure for hernia surgery has traditionally focused on recurrence, but in recent years, there's been a paradigm shift towards a greater focus on patient satisfaction and patient reported outcome measures. This is reflected in the number of hernia specific prom questions that have featured in the final list of questions selected during this Delphi process. Appropriate tools for collecting these outcomes will need to be developed to enable seamless integration into current and planned hernia registries. Now, the question, should the operating surgeon be informed of their recurrence or incisional hernia rate, is an interesting but potentially contentious one that, that may generate more questions than, than answers. Although most surgeons and patients will likely want to know, the practicality of collecting and using this information to change practice may be challenging. At the time of the final prioritization process, there was a, a positive high quality evidence on the long-term complications associated with IPOM repair. But Dr. Henriksen and colleagues have recently published a nationwide database study on the short and long-term outcomes of IPOM repair and concluded that it should still be considered for fascial defects between two and six centimeters. The authors conducted this study on behalf of the Danish hernia database, which has included ventral hernia since 2007. Several other hernia registries now exist. The United Kingdom's hernia registry is in fruition with plans to pilot data entry shortly. And to this end, the top priority research question as identified by this Delphi process, what data should be collected in a UK hernia registry will hopefully be addressed. Three of the 14 prioritised questions from the patient focus group um, were selected. And whilst there was some overlap between surgeon and patient questions, there was also some major disparities. Many questions submitted to the patient focus group were related to preoperative information and cosmesis. Interestingly, these topics were not prioritised to the final list. But perhaps we as medical professionals should be spending more time researching these topics in order to optimise the patient's experience. In summary, we have undertaken a modified Delphi process to determine a list of hernia research priorities. 
The study involved a large body of uh, multidisciplinary healthcare professionals across multiple centres worldwide. Unique to this hernia study was the direct involvement of patients during all three phases and the patient focus group. These priorities should now all be addressed by well-designed, well high-quality international collaborative research. I would like to, to thank everyone who attended the patient focus group, all stakeholders who submitted questions, the Delphi Steering Committee and the British Hernia Society for kindly funding this study and supporting the process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, uh, Duncan, for that. That was, um, that was a lot of uh, work. Obviously, I was involved in this uh, to a degree, so I don't have quite so many questions, but it might be useful to share with uh, uh, our audience what you thought were the good points and perhaps more importantly, the challenges of working with a patient group. We, we were very conscious at, at the start to, to, to ensure that um, we as clinicians, as surgeons did not um, dominate any discussions at all and we would, we would take a back seat. And I think we managed to achieve that using the, the patient and public in, in, um, involvement members. However, there may still be a degree of bias um, with, with us being there and being present as well. And, and, and some of us um, knew the patient, so that might have um, created some, some bias. Um, I think the, what I would like to do or what I think we should do to change things is include more patients and to have more of a mixture our patient focus group was dominated by those who had had surgery and therefore pain was, was a, more of a, a common discussion point than some of the other maybe preoperative concerns. The discussion itself, it was, it was great to have the PPIs involved because they managed to steer the conversation away. A, 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 few, a few moments, it almost felt like a platform just to, to, to understandably so just vent some of the, the concerns or the frustrations that patients had had. Um, overall, I think it was, it, it was beneficial. It was, a, it was a good patient focus group, but there are definitely areas for, for improvement. And, and I hope in the future we, we, can, we can do that. Yeah, because if you just look at the list that's up there, you know, we have 14 uh, questions, but um, from questions 3 to 11, they're really outcomes that are, are quite important for the patient and indeed how to measure uh, uh, the outcome as well. So even though patients were a relatively small number in all of this, I think what's coming through is the need um, to measure the right outcome and to measure it properly. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And I, I saw a, a, a tweet earlier on today from Professor Neil, Neil Smart uh, about the quality of life now and, and to, that to be more of a primary outcome measure than recurrence in hernia surgery. And I, I think I, I took a lot from this. this. Our information here, so this, what we've shown supports that as well. And do you feel confident in the outcome that we've got the right priorities? In other words, we've had a big enough um, survey, we've had enough uh, patients, enough uh, surgeons involved? I, I think for the developed develop world, world, it's a start. Um, for the developing world, obviously not. We tried to, this was supposed to be a worldwide, um, but uh, obviously when you're, when you're making it available just through Twitter, that, 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 that of course um, um, has some challenges. Um, I think we've captured, I think we've captured, yes, the, the, the vast majority, but there are certainly more, um, more questions that are, that are unanswered, but this is a, certainly a, a good start. Manuel, in line in line with this last question from you, Andrew, uh, we have in the chat a very interesting question from coming from Martin Simmons and uh, asking uh, what level of evidence should agreed Delphi have, or in the best methodological scenario, what uh, level of evidence uh, have a, a Delphi uh, methodology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess the level of evidence would be in expert uh, opinion. I don't think it's any, it's any higher than that, is it? But um, 
so it is the it's it's probably the the the, the lowest of the evidence I, I would say i don't know if mr debo would, would agree with that but i think i think that's where it would rank within the 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 um the level of evidence one Another another limitation you you think that can be uh, that the mixed uh, different stakeholders because uh, here I, I understand that uh, not surgeons with uh, special interest with hernia and other surgeons without interest in hernia it can be a limit limitation for this uh, work. Yes, that, that's right. That, but with the, the steering committee who were selected were consisted of, of, of surgeons who, who, if not predominantly, are just are, are hernia surgeons solely or it's a, a major part of their practice, as were the surgical trainees such as myself at the time. Um, so I think we managed to extrapolate the appropriate questions um, and, and omit those that we didn't think were... Were, were important. It's an interesting comment that Manuel, but because we tend to focus on patient groups, surgeon groups, but inguinal hernias are common. There must be a big group of hernia surgeons who have had an inguinal hernia and they would be an interesting group to study because they are part patient, part surgeon. And it'd be interesting to see their results. Are they nearer patient outcomes or are they nearer surgeon outcomes? Uh, Duncan, what do you think? Yeah, there, there were there were a few actually. There were a few, and you're right. They, the, the, the questions moved more over towards the being a patient than than a surgeon. And again, this touches on the quality of life. Um, so I think that once again just reiterates and emphasises the importance of of quality of life after hernia surgery. And I think meeting patient expectations and ensuring that we have a real good grasp of why patients want. Um, hernia surgery or their hernia repair is, is, is pivotal before we, under, we, before we undertake um, any surgery. Uh, thanks, Duncan. Uh, Martin Simmons is still going. I don't know if 50 uh, uh, surgeons' is, uh, evidence is level five or where it is, but I suppose it's the methodology. But um, we'll need to ask some uh, methodologists where the level of evidence of Adelphi goes because it's out with my, um, my pay scale, I think. Thanks, Duncan. And uh, it's a pleasure now to introduce the last speaker, uh, Joanna, who's done some very interesting work on uh, quality of life uh, across uh, a number of uh, hospitals. And uh, it's with great pleasure to hand over to Joanna uh, to give the final presentation. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, thank you um, to um, Duncan to also set up um, su such a good um introduction to what I'm going to talk about because I'm actually going to talk about um, quality of life. Give me one second to put my slides up. Um, so I, my name is, sorry, um, something is wrong. Okay, I think I'm able to share now. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So my name is Ron, I'm a surgical trainee uh, and a research fellow from Portugal, and I'm here to talk to you about a study that was run by the Portuguese Surgical Collaborative Group. Um, so this is a trainee-led group um, that uh, de delivered this cohort study on the predictors of quality of life after open inguinal hernia repair using the EHS KOL score. So Really, why did we do this study? Um, as trainees and as a group of trainees, we wanted to know what can we do better for our patients, what in the perioperative management of our patients, which includes pre, intra and post-operative, what can we do to improve care for our patients? And one of the things was we need to focus on quality of life because as we've been talking throughout this session and in other many sessions um, about hernia that's the outcome we want to focus on and between the the existing outcomes that's probably the one we need to focus and then we thought how are we going to do research about this we need to identify who are the patients who do worse so we can do something about it and that was sort of the remit for this study and our aim therefore was to identify predictors of low quality of life after open inguinal repair 
And why opening and only repair? Well, we focused on this because we know that many of the repairs uh, being done these days um, are, are, are still open. However, the laparoscopy is taking over, obviously. Um, but in, in the real world at the moment, uh, the majority of the people are not yet trained to do that. And therefore, um, a majority of our patients in our study were um, operated by open uh, via uh, an open repair. And therefore, we focused on these patients for this particular analysis. So the design was of our study, we've conducted a prospective multicentric multicentric cohort study that ran in Portugal from uh, October to December 2019. Any hospital performing open uh, inguinal hernia repair could take part. And the inclusion criteria in this um, analysis was um, consecutive adult patients undergoing an elective hernia repair, inguinal or um, femoral, um, and we focused on the outcomes of these uh, patients. The primary outcome that we have defined was there for quality of life after three months um, after the surgical procedure. And we've defined this and we've assessed this using the ERHS quality of life score. And we've used the version that is currently translated into Portuguese. So just to let everyone know a bit more about this outcome, um, this um, patient reported outcome measure is a questionnaire of nine questions. Um, the questions vary from asking patients about pain, about the, the restriction of activities, and about the cosmetic discomfort after surgery. And for each of the nine questions, the patient can rate their quality of life uh, from zero to 10, given that for pain, for instance, zero is no pain and 10 is the maximum pain they could have. So therefore, the, the whole questionnaire can range from zero to 90 um, when we sum up the, the nine questions. So where zero means better quality of life and 90 means lower quality of life or worse quality of life. So therefore, to define who are the patients who are doing worse, so we can predict what's, what's associated with that, we've defined quality of life as the patients located in the higher Tertile of, tertile of this score, which means the ones that are on the top, um, top third of this, of this score. We have included in total 893 patients across 33 hospitals in our country. As you know, our, our country is not very big, so 33 hospitals is, is quite a good sample um, for the inclusion in this, in this uh, study. And I can't be more grateful to, to all the collaborators across the continental and the islands that took part in this study. Um, in terms of who are these patients, just to give you an overview of um, how the sample was, um, was presenting, most of them were men, as we would expect, given that um, inguinal hernias are more frequent in men. Most of them were unilateral. And just to give you um, an overview, most of our patients were up, uh, around half of our patients operated with a lesion sign technique, but the other half were operated with other, other techniques, namely the plug and patch technique. And this is something that obviously we, we will discuss and that is now prompting um, some intervention in our country as well, because as you know, the lesion sign technique is the gold standard for open surgery. So in terms of the outcomes and the results of our study, we have used this um, patient reported outcome measure. So we, we've assessed quality of life at three months after surgery, but we've also done that before surgery. And that's important um, because that's the gold standard evaluation for quality of life. And also we're able to not only compare, but also to adjust for previous quality of life. So as you see here, the distribution of the quality of life score goes from a wider and, um, you know, a, a wider distribution before surgery than it is after surgery, which means that the median quality of life drops in the score, which means that patients have better quality of life after they've been operated. And that's quite a big uh, drop from before surgery to three months after surgery. Our main endpoint was there, was there therefore to understand who are the patients who are doing worse um, and having a lower po post-operative quality of life. We have done a logistic regression model um, adjusting for different factors, pre-operative, interoperative, and post-operative as well. And the ones that were independently associated with low post-operative quality of life were young age, uh, patients um, aged under six years old, low pre-operative quality of life, 
a non-observable mesh fixation, a severe post-operative pain score with a VAS over seven, and minor complications after surgery. And how can we interpret these results? I think the main messages from these, this analysis um, are probably not too uh, unfamiliar to you. We've seen these trends described for um, pain, and we know that pain is a big driver of quality of life as well. But uh, what I think, acknowledging those limitations, I think the main messages from this study are really that when patients have a poor preoperative quality of life, they have a poor or a poorer result after surgery, at least at three months they do. So we should definitely um, assess quality of life before surgery. We should inform our patients if they're performing badly before surgery, they are more likely to have worse results on the long term. And this should be part of our informed consents together with the other risks that we obviously need to discuss with patients. The other thing that we can discuss is the caution that we should have in when fixating the mesh. And we see here that the non-absorbable fixation can have um, an impact at three months after surgery. Um, we also know that because it's an observational study, there might be some selection bias and factors that we can't control for, but at least we can recommend caution when doing this. And the other point that I would like to, um, to convey to you is how can we optimize post-operative, immediate post-operative pain? Because what we found out is that patients that have high pain in the first week after surgery then have higher pain on the long term. So what are the strategies that we need to develop to better control pain after surgery so we can have better quality of life on the long term? And I think that's probably a, a research question for the future that we can, um, we can perhaps pursue with another study. So my question really today, as we're rerunning this um, session and opening the discussion, um, after this, this study that sort of flags up some of the things that we can be able to control to make things better for our patients, what is also the future of the research focusing on patient reported outcome measures? Um, from the four, three, besides mine, uh, presentations here today. I think we have some ideas on how we can move forward, but I think the European Hernia Society is an amazing platform so we can launch into future studies that really matter for our patients. So I would, I would open the, the discussion to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna, for a great presentation and congratulations for the study. And I... Uh... I have some question. First, uh, we have some question from the from the audience. Um, one of them, maybe you were explaining it at the beginning of your presentation, but uh, why didn't you include the laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs in the study? So our study included all elect elective inguinal hernia and femoral hernia repairs. For this particular analysis, um, we didn't include them for two reasons. First of all, in the hospitals that were included in the study, only from the 950 patients included, only 43% of 43 patients were operated by laparoscopy. So we thought, you know, they are fundamentally a very different group with very different risk factors for different types of pain, probably. So we thought that the main analysis should focus and be generalizable for open inguinal hernia repairs. We thought that in terms of the research methodology that would be more appropriate. Okay, another question from my side is, uh, um, as you know, probably uh, the best way to, to, uh, to do a, a study of quality of life in a surgical uh, procedure like uh, inguinal hernia repair is to, uh, to combine a general score like uh, UHS score and, and a specific score for the, for the, for the pathology and the study in, in, in this case, um, why why was the reason for not combination of uh, this general score with a specific uh, score of about quality of life in inguinal hernia repair? Because maybe it's a limitation to analyze the quality of life of a patient from a general point of view, and uh, we need to combine and um, with a specific score. What do you think about that and the limitation of that uh, regarding the study? So that's a great point. Actually, the RHS KOL score 
is hernia specific so all the questions the nine questions are do you have pain um, at rest do you have pain during activities did you have pain in the last week and all the questions are focused on the impact of the hernia in patient activities pain and discomfort so in that regard i think we can call it a hernia specific score but you make a very good point about which scores are we using and how are we comparing them. I think we've done, we've made this point in Duncan's presentation as well. So should we be looking into different outcome measures? Should we be um, comparing the outcome measures that are already available and perhaps finding an optimal one? Because the UHS KOL was a consensus process, again, between surgeons, and um, I don't think patients had a lot of input in it. And I think new scores that were published perhaps more recently have more impact um, and more input from patients. So I think there is definitely a role for a study comparing a general quality of life score and uh, an existing well-used um, hernia specific score. And also uh, one of the more recent ones that had more input from patients, compare how they perform against each other and come with perhaps an optimal quality of life assessment score. And the URHS you used uh, was validated for the Portuguese uh, population? It was validated in the English version. It's translated by the national chapters of the, the European Hernia Society into the other languages, but not validated conventionally in those languages. Another question coming from the audience is, is uh, because it's surprising for us, uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the EHS uh, guidelines of, uh, or world guidelines of uh, growing treatment, growing hernia treatment, uh, the plug and patch uh, maybe is not the best uh, option and is, uh, is not recommended by the, the, the guidelines. What do, what do you think about this almost 40% of patients operate on using a, a plug and patch. Definitely. That's been, as, as, you, as you might imagine, that's, it's not the first time I have that question. Um, it's been a huge um, uh, topic of discussion. We've presented this in two national conferences already, and we are liaising with um, uh, nation, the National Society to get this data out to the surgeons and make some form of quality improvement project, an educational project. Um, we're also trying to build online education modules in inguinal hernia that include these um, these different topics. It is definitely something that needs to be approached in our community To We know that the evidence for Liechtenstein is obviously better because also the studies that included the other techniques are not as robust, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that it's the best evidence we've got. And so the recommendation for open inguinal surgery is Liechtenstein, and that should be what people would be doing for the majority of the cases. Um, so, so that is something that needs intervention for sure. But that's why we would do research is so we can find where the problems are so we can go and tackle them. Thank you, Joanna. Andrew, uh, do you want to ask something? Thanks, uh, Manuel. A couple other questions. One of the, you know, post-operative pain can happen for a variety of reasons or high post-operative pain. One is that the um, a Dr. East asked, you know, perhaps the nurses don't manage the pain very well, or is it because something's already happened interoperatively that's causing pain, which is not going to go away with analgesia? So I think you make a good point and I would even add something. So I think we've got something interoperatively that can be actually the main driver of pain. And from this study, the only interoperative factor that we've got was the non-observable mesh fixation, but there might be other things related, you know, in other studies, such as nerve handling, nerve section, et cetera, that in other studies were identified. Um, I think it's about how we manage pain after surgery. And that's done very differently across the country. So uh, because I've, I've been working for a few years now in the UK while doing my research, I see that opioid analgesia is much more used here than it is in other countries in Europe. So it would be interesting to sort of compare those strategies and see what works best and what has the best outcome on the long term. But I would even add something that is important, in my opinion, which is there is another big factor, which is how is the patient, how likely is the patient to report high pain? How likely is the patient to report low quality of life? Is this something that is driven by the 
treatment pathway, or is this something that is driven by the patient features and what pa patients value when they're answering a questionnaire about pain and quality of life? So I think there, there are some things that we need to approach technically and clinically, but there are also some things we need to explore in terms of what we can offer to patients with, diff with specific features and more likelihood of suffering from pain and low quality of life after surgery. Joanna, thanks. One last quick question from one of your Portuguese compatriots. And did you have any data on the grade or rank of surgeon? And did that make any difference? Um, so we did not include the, we only had data on if the, the, the surgery was performed by a trainee or a, a you know, a consultant surgeon. Um, and I think it was about, um, about half, half, um, half of the hernias were repaired by consultants, half by trainees. We did not include that in the logistic model. So I cannot say if it made a difference. We didn't think that it had a clinical rationale to be included in the model. So therefore we did not test for that particular variable. Thanks very much, uh, Joanna, and I'm conscious of time and we should think about uh, wrapping up. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the a rerun of the 2021 um, BGS EHS uh, prize. And uh, just um, a little information for the background. These are obviously papers submitted over a period of time during 2021 to the British Journal of Surgery. Not all the papers will be accepted for publication, but they are looked at by the editor of the... Um, BGS and of BGS Open, and they choose the winner, they choose the runner-up, and they choose the next two best papers so that we have four presentations. And through our, our strategic partnership with the BGS uh, Society, we have financial uh, prizes for the winner and the runner-up. And the runner-up wins 1,500 euros. That's 1,500 euros, ladies and gentlemen. And the winner gets 3,500 euros, 3,500 euros. So it's a great prize. So I do hope as we open the 2022 competition that you're all writing your papers. We will give you more details shortly. But the key is you have to have your research done, your paper written and submitted to the British Journal of Surgery by the 31st of May, 2022. And what we failed to mention was that the runner-up last year was Joanna, uh, the proud winner of 1,500 euros, and the winner was Barbara East. Uh, so the drinks are on Barbara when we're in uh, Manchester. She's the one that's going to be uh, flush with cash. So well done uh, to both uh, uh, the ladies in the, in the team. It's been a pleasure to have you all. Uh, I hope this inspires you to go away and do some more research and get in on the prize and um, uh, it's been a, a lot of fun. And I'll leave the last words to Manuel, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Andrew. I, I will prepare just uh, finishing this session. I will start preparing my manuscript to send, uh, to send to the BGS to apply for the prize, the BGS, a fantastic prize. It was yeah. an absolute pleasure to be here together with you, co-chairing this uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic meeting and fantastic uh, speeches and uh, a nice discussion. And, Thank you again to the European Hernia Society and thank you again to the British Journal Surgery Society. Uh, for me, uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So to Manuel, uh, Barbara, Joanna, Bent and Duncan, to the BGS team in the background uh, and to all you out there listening, uh, good night, have a good time and uh, get writing your papers. All the best. So thank you. Good night. <laughs>